Hi, I'm Erin Foberg, author of Human Geography, People, Place, and Culture, published by Wiley. We just finished the 12th edition and it's available. Today I'm talking to you about some of the big ideas in AP Human Geography to help you get through this online education period. I'm talking about nations and states. These are two really important concepts that show up repeatedly. So the concepts of nations and states tie into the bigger concept of identity. Identity is an umbrella concept in geography. It's how we make sense of ourselves. It can include race, gender, ethnicity, sexuality. Identity also includes nations. And we can identify ourselves in different ways. We can have different identities at different scales, at different times in our lives even in different places. So if you grow up, let's say, in the Midwest, and you go to college on the East Coast, you might have never really identified as a Midwesterner, but in this new location, you have this new identity as a Midwesterner because you're different from the people around you. So when you think about identity, it's contextually dependent. Um, and when you think about identity, it's constructed because we decide what makes sense for ourselves. We decide how we want to identify ourselves. Today, I want to think about the construction of identity and how the way we've constructed identities changed over time, along with the concept of the state. The concept of the state brought in the new identity of the nation and intensified that identity. Um, and the goal of the nation state came about in concert with colonialism, which we'll talk about in the next video. So let's talk today quickly about the concept of the state. When you think of a state, the state is fundamentally a territory. Uh, in international law, the state is an entity. It comes from the Treaty of Montevideo in 1933, defined the state as having four things. Um, a state is a territory, it has a permanent population, it has a government, and it has the ability to enter into relations with other states, which means that it's recognized by other states. Where did this idea of the, the sovereign state come from? Sovereignty is another concept in international law. Sovereignty means that the state ultimately has the last say. It has a last say over what happens within its territory. So the fundamental thing to remember about the sovereign state is that it is a territory. It's a territory. And before the sovereign state, if we go back this slide again, before the 1500s, before we had this idea of the sovereign state, society defined territory. But with the advent of the sovereign state and its institutionalization under international law, territory defines sovereignty. How did that happen? Well, in 1648, there was an agreement called the Peace of Westphalia. It was actually a series of treaties that ended the 30s year, 30 years war. That's a really hard one to say. Um, the Peace of Westphalia said that the sovereign would have the last say over a territory. So instead of, again, having the people say, I identify with this king, and this king's territory is everywhere the people who identify with this king are. Instead of that, instead of society saying, this is our territory, what happened after the Peace of Westphalia is we created maps of Europe that looked like this, and these maps then carved out states, countries that don't overlap. And these territories then became separate, distinct, sovereign territories with one people in them and that people within them were part of that state now. So the territory now defines the people or the society instead of the people or the society defining the territory. Now, Europe was not the only place that had the concept of the sovereign state. Southeast Asia certainly did too. And if we look at this map, it shows you Southeast Asian uh, kingdom states or temple states in the between 500 and 1500. So the same time frame. Um, and you can see, for instance, a place you've maybe heard of is Angkor Wat. It's a really famous temple state uh, where the Khmer people lived. And the Khmer people had a territory. They built many temples within that area, including the famous uh, Angkor Wat. And that's one of the, the many temple states that existed in Southeast Asia. So they had defined territories in that sense. So too did Africa. There were, there were state-like entities in Africa as well. But what happens with Europe is that we get the concept of the nation state. And so in Europe, the goal becomes 
let's make a state, let's define this territory, and now let's make a nation, a group of people that meshes with it. Let's make them the same. Let's the, make the borders overlap with one another. So the nation is the people within the state, and the state is the territory of the nation. That's the concept of the nation state. And how did the European concept of the nation state end up being the one that's enveloped the entire world? It happened through colonialism. So yes, there were state-like entities in Southeast Asia and there were state-like entities in Africa, but because Europe is the one that colonized the world from the 1500s on and came to colonize almost the entire world, they brought with them and diffused with them this European notion of the nation state that comes from that piece of Westphalia. So the modern concept of the nation state brought us to the, the conundrum that we have in the world today, where nations and states don't mesh. A state is a territory. A nation is a group of people. That's the easiest way to remember the difference. A nation is really cool and it's super powerful because the idea of the nation is that the people see themselves together. Benedict Anderson had the great definition of the nation as an imagined community. A nation is a group of people that won't ever all meet each other, but they identify together. They see themselves as a nation. They see themselves, they imagine themselves, they imagine a history that they shared the past and a future when they look to the future, they see themselves together. That's a concept of a nation. So a state's a territory, a nation's a people. And because the nation and the state, even though the European ideal is that they should mesh, and they, because they rarely mesh, we get all of these conundrums. We get all these situations where the nation and the state don't mesh and some political issues that come from that. So this is a drawing that Alec made and our cartographers made into a little graphic for us. The first one is a nation state. That's the European ideal. We're gonna have the nations of people mesh perfectly with the state borders, those are nation states. The next is a multinational state. The next is a multi-state nation. And then finally, a non-state nation. I'm mentioning those three quickly because now to try and remember what the difference is among those three, I want you to look at the list and I want you to always focus on the last word. So a multinational state is a state with many nations. A multi-state nation is a nation that goes across multiple states. And a non-state nation is a nation without a state. So when you're learning these three, always learn the last word or focus on the last word first. The idea of the nation state, there really aren't any nation states out there. The closest maybe is Iceland. And I remember reading this article about how closely linked um, in terms of history uh, the people of Iceland are. And it made me think about maybe Iceland could define itself as a nation state. Uh, but really, there aren't any perfect nation states. There, there are no nation states in the world. Um, multinational states, a good example, of, well, pretty much every country in the world is a multinational state. A good example is Pakistan. You've got four major nations within one state. It's not just one group of people, but it's at least four major groups of people within one state. That's a multinational state. Multi-state nations occur when you have many um states where one nation is is across many states and eastern europe's got a lot of good examples of that so for example serbia it, serbs are found in serbia also in bosnia uh croats are found in croatia also in bosnia those are multi-state nations um, a non-state nation the big example people use is are the kurds they are a nation that goes across many states, but they don't have their own home state. So the distinction here for the Kurds is they don't have a home state. They don't have a state where they are the majority, where they can define that state as theirs. Whereas if you go back, the Serbs have a state, the Croats have a state, they just extend over the borders into other states to become multi-state nations, but non-state nations have no state of their own. That's the distinction between a multi-state nation and a non-state nation. So in sum, what I want you to understand is when you look at this map of the world's countries, um, it, it makes you think you've got 
more than 190 nation states in the world, but really none of them is truly a nation state. And on that map, what's hidden completely are the non-state nations. So when you look at a political map, you gotta think geographically and dig a little deeper to see what's really going on.